Well, hey, thanks for letting me uh, come and talk to you tonight. Um, I hope that this talk can help uh, help some folks that are kind of going through the journey that uh, that I went through not too long ago in trying to make some decisions about bringing nerves in. And and uh, I hope this is a little bit of being able to give back uh, to to see some some comfort for some other people that may be scratching their head about, hey, man, is this is this ready to go? Or, and what's been your experience with uh, with adopting? Uh, some of this tech. So uh, real quick, who am I? Um, been in the tech world about three decades, but uh, about the last 15 years, I've been specializing in distributed energy companies, primarily CTO type roles. And, uh, and I think that that part about distributed energy companies is really important because I believe very fundamentally that a lot of the challenges that we have in building these types of systems that have to integrate with the real world and talk to hardware and operate every second of every day of every year um, are a super perfect fit for some of this beam oriented tech. And um, as you'll see on this next slide, I've been kind of scratching my head around this tech for a while now. And um, for me, this journey actually started in a really obtuse way um, almost a decade ago. Um, I was at a company called Converge. I was a CTO there, and we had a Ruby on Rails app that was um, dealing with demand response and connecting to a bunch of smart thermostats, and we were getting some success. And long story short on that, we had several hundred thousand thermostats that were trying to connect to a Ruby app. And the concurrency model just was falling over. We were throwing a lot of money at servers, really scratching our heads about get this, getting this thing to scale. And um, we ended up inserting in the middle of this an eJabberD server, which you know under the hood is all Erlang. And I'll be totally honest, I had really no concept of what the Beam was and what that offered at that time. I just knew that it solved an amazing problem really, really quickly and elegantly. And I kind of filed it away in the back of my head, like I got to learn some more about that at some point in time. Um, Cause I don't, I didn't fully did not appreciate the tech that was underneath this at, at that moment in time. Then I started to hear this, this, some of this movement around Elixir and Phoenix and um, remembered and kind of connected the dots with that his with that history that I'd had and started doing a lot of personal experimentation around that. And, you know, I think it would be, I, I had to be very, very honest that encouraging um, Imbala to adopt Elixir back in 2016 in Phoenix was probably a, one of the riskier decisions that I've made as a technology leader in my career. Um, but I could see the potential in it. And the story actually turned out really, really well, because while we didn't have a ton of clients, we did sell the company for a pretty amazing figure. And so you can imagine that if there weren't, wasn't a lot of recurring revenue on that, that they bought it for the tech. And that's what they did. And if any of you were at uh, ElixirConf this past year, you might have saw a table in the, in the uh, kind of general area from Generac. And Generac is the company that bought uh, Imbala and that tech, and they're they're all in on it. And they even sponsored uh, were a sponsor at the conference. And so I feel pretty proud about like introducing it to that that genre of things. There's a little diversion from my whole um, ecosystem around energy. Went to film school, built an application personally for that school um, to deal with some problems, which doesn't really need Elixir and Phoenix, but it was interesting nonetheless because what that did for me is it gave me a lot of confidence and intuition about some of the new things that are happening in the in the beam world and um, really set me up to make some decisions later on. I'll kind of skip over the sea power thing, but it's another company in the in the energy space that, that I introduced some some of this tech to. And then really what the meat of this about is now um, introducing nerves at Gridpoint. And of course, we, we're also using Elixir and Phoenix on the server side. But while this is the second company that I've uh, been in, that I've been in charge of hardware and firmware, um, this is the first company where um, I've, I've actually used nerves. And so it's a little bit of a change, uh, a little bit of a change for me. I kind of want to walk you through that, uh, that journey. Okay, so just real quick, um, 
Great point. The, the company that we're going to talk about here is in the energy space. We basically build um, energy management systems for small to medium-sized commercial buildings. We go in and we wire the buildings with automation and sensors, and then we have software that controls and optimizes that energy usage. And there's one figure on here, the 17,000 sites that I wanted to highlight because it's going to be important to one of the things that I want to talk about, which I think is a something that we're doing that's fairly unique in the in the NERVS community. Um, and I think it's important to get out there because I hope other companies uh, that may be experiencing this problem of having a large in legacy install base um, can look to some of the things that we've done and say, hey, there is a path here to, uh, to not doing a greenfield application, but an upgrade uh, in addition to that. So keep that 17,000 uh, figure in mind for a little bit later. Okay. So, um, Bitpoint was, has been around for like a decade. And, you know, any company that's been around for that long, you can imagine, uh, has gone through some twists and turns. And that's good and bad. Um, it's good because we've actually found our market fit and we, we, we know where we're going. Uh, it's a little bad because you can accumulate some interesting cruft. But then that cruft can be a little bit good in terms of motivating the ability to make some of these more bold technical changes that we're introducing at Gridpoint. And, you know, I think that was, if you look down this list of things that we that we have here, these were a lot of the challenges that allowed me to go to the rest of the executive team and our investors and convince them that the next generation of our platform and where we were trying to go was really justifiable, uh, that, that change and that growth pattern based on where we were, was justifying a fairly significant architectural and technology change. And so if you just read down those, you can you can see that basically at every layer of our system, we had some motivations for making significant surgery. And this is what laid the foundation for me being able to make some pretty dramatic shifts. Um, I'm not saying that everybody has this type of situation where you can where you can stand on those types of problems and pontificate about how that how life could be better, but this was our particular situation. I think anytime you talk about building a team in, underneath the beam, whether it's pure Elixir and Phoenix or whether it's going into nerves, I hear from peers and whatnot, the, a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt about building out teams and betting on this. And I think that that is a misconceived notion. And I just want to put it out there that I believe that we are at a point where building out a really, really talented team underneath this tech is not only possible, but really fairly straightforward if you handle it in, in a particular way. And we went through the process of hiring over 30 technologists, and we did it in the span of about two quarters. And we didn't just hire some you know, random folks. We hired some pretty high-end talent, and we were super picky about a lot of that talent to the point where we even I even put in some pretty aggressive um, diversity standards that we tried to adhere to. And uh, that definitely constricted the pipeline even further. But even with those constraints, we were able to build a pretty solid team. And I think for us, it came down to these three advantages that we, we really led with. One, we're a mission-driven company. And you know that is, not everybody has that, but looking at what your differentiating factors are like this is a big deal. When I was you know, interviewing candidates and we started talking about you know, our push and what we were trying to do in the energy economy and how we were trying to make a little bit of a dent in this global problem, you instantly have engineers hooked on that. And there's a lot of folks that care about that problem. And then when we were making this shift, that enabled us to signal like, hey, you're not going to be working on a legacy code base. Like this is a brand new greenfield application. But yet it's not at some random startup that's trying to figure out what is our market fit. So it was an established company. And this was really the trifecta that just that made it, it gave us a lot of latitude here. But all was not great. Um, I struggled immensely to hire QA engineers in this space. And a lot of that was self-inflicted. I'll admit that up front. Uh, because I have a very particular and pedantic view of how I like to run QA. Uh, in a perfect world, I would say that 
QA engineers that I would hire would be developers that got fed up with not having great code out there and made the, the switch over to being a QA engineer. And we failed miserably at finding those folks um, in in both the, the Phoenix and the Nerve side of things. So we had to back off of that and, and move over to more of an educational strategy. Okay, so that kind of lays the groundwork. So what are what are we at what is the what are we actually building and what does it look like and how does NERVS fit into it? So our a really, really simplified view of what we've got is um, a Postgres database, a cluster of Phoenix servers. And um, on the left-hand side, we manufacture and build a lot of hardware to wire these buildings. We build our own smart thermostats. We have lighting control interfaces. We do deep sub-metering, main load metering, and we have a gateway device that uh, essentially translates from a wide area network to a bunch of local area networks. And the change that we started with was moving over to something that looked like this, from an, a Java and Angular uh, world on the server to a Phoenix and live view world um, on this path. And it's important to highlight that bar of the Phoenix channels there. And, now, and the reason for that will become evident in just a second, but that was a a, uh, I think an architectural decision that has helped us in a lot of ways and has impacted our nerves development in some interesting ways as well. And so what we've decided is that all of the interactions to our server are gonna go through Phoenix channels. And that's our iOS apps, that's our browser, and it's our hardware as well in, form, in the form of that gateway. So here's what's interesting about that is that that became a that these Phoenix channels, this, this decision right here, became a little bit of a forcing function for how we started to get our firmware engineers interested in the NERVS ecosystem. And it started out by essentially saying, hey, C and C++ firmware engineers, can you connect to these socket, the socket-based communication channel and eliminate the cruft of our old legacy protocol of how we were talking back and forth, which honestly was a huge pain point for a lot of our software and firmware engineers. And they found a library that they compiled into a one-off version of the firmware and got those devices talking to our new backend system within just a couple of days. And you started to see some lights come on. like. These people that had been struggling with a lot of slow and monotonous development and not a lot of progress, all of a sudden we're like, wow, that's pretty cool. What is that thing on the other side of the pipe? And it was a very interesting experience to watch the kind of the lights come on and the, and the firmware engineering team to start to ask some questions and become curious about the Elixir world. And honestly, this is what started to give me a little sliver of a hope that we may be able to look at NERVS as a, as a technology in enhancement to that architectural picture I just showed you. Well, um, we're in the process of making that change. Um, we are only making the change right now for having that the firmware on the gateway device be a nerves based system. A, a few of these other pieces of hardware are really, really, really low power or um, have other, other uh, issues that we are not prepared to go down the nerves path or may never be prepared, we don't know, but we have gone all in on building the firmware for the, for the gateway device. And this has been a really interesting um, experience because initially we weren't doing this and we were seeing some interesting friction between our server and our firmware team, being able to unpack binary protocols, keep in sync with how all that worked. Um, all those things were not bad, but there was just a little bit of friction there. And honestly, as we started to make this shift over to uh, nerves on the gateway, we saw a lot of those um, 
those points of friction just start to evaporate a little bit. Um, I'll point, uh, we, uh, we did uh, add a few other interesting pieces of tech to the next generation of our gateway that I think NERVS is making it a little much easier to, to get our head around. And that is uh, we added, well, uh, Wi-Fi, it's not a big deal there. That could have been done in any way. But we also added LoRa, which is, if you don't know what LoRa is, a very low powered um, wireless networking technology. And this was important for us to be able to get uh, sensors that are battery operated and put into like really odd and remote places uh, that didn't need to have their battery changed, you know, more than like once every couple of years. Uh, so adding some of that tech in place was a lot easier uh, trying to, to deal with these new standards, these new protocols, and not having the the drag or the difficulty of doing that in C or C++. So um, why really did we change to nerves? Like what were, what were the, the reasons from a business perspective? And, you know, just being, you know, a little bit transparent, you know, we had some firmware update stability problems. Uh, you know, when you've got 17,000 sites out there and you're constantly releasing new features and functionality, um, you better have that down to a science. And even though we are at a really high percentage, um, we have a very, very restrictive client base on what they will tolerate in terms of lost connectivity or issues. And honestly, I, I struggled with trying to figure out how to improve our firmware update stability with our home rolled or homegrown uh, hand rolled type of update strategy. And for me, looking at some of the repeatability that came with came out of the box or semi out of the box with nerves in terms of being able to do that was something that I could talk to our investors about and convince them, hey, this is a great idea. This was also, I think this is a longer term goal. And I don't know that how this will actually play out in the long term, but the unified language with the server team is really interesting to me from a possible ability to flex resources across the firmware and server side. We have engineers, server side engineers that are fascinated with trying to get into firmware. And I firmly believe that we're actually going to be holding them back a little bit to try to keep them focused on their day jobs uh, before they, uh, they jump all over onto the firmware side. And I think that will naturally evolve for us because we have a lot of low level features and functionality that we're building out right now. But I'm hopeful, and I think it's real, that once we get into doing more and more of just the domain-oriented work on the firmware side of things, that we will be able to flex across uh, our developers much, much more than we are today. And I do think that we are seeing a reduced code footprint. Um, you know, the, there is a lot of things that you get for free in OTP that our firmware engineers had spent years trying to hand roll and get right. And it is, it is no joke uh, that we had a very, very large code base that had some, some interesting infrastructural work that is now just a total non-issue uh, as we go all in on nerves. Um, so yeah, that's been really interesting. So those are some of the motivations that allowed us to say to the rest of the organization, here's why we're going to make a significant change. Okay, so what's been unique about this experience for us? Um, the remote upgrade, hands down. Um, this was an absolute requirement that I had put out when we started hiring the, the NERVS firmware engineers. And I kind of put it out there in the middle of the interview process. I said, hey, look, if we can't figure out how to remotely flash all of our existing controllers up to NERVS, then we're not doing it because we can't roll a truck and change these things out. And I can't really afford to create two parallel paths of development. All of my speed and of speed of development and unification of development resources, all those um, soft benefits just evaporate if I have to keep these existing 17,000 sites on the old firmware. And I'm happy to report that as of last week, we actually proved out the ability to 
remotely flash from our old C++ firmware to the new firm's firm, uh, NERVS firmware image. And there's a ton of low-level stuff that goes on that I am not qualified to speak about. You know, talk down at the U-boot level and things like that and reallocating partitions and all kinds of weirdness that went on to make that happen. Um, but we, we got that to, to occur. And so if you're at a company out there and you're like, ah, nerves is great, but I'm, I've got all this stuff out in the field. I think there's a path for you. And we did, it wasn't something that happened overnight, but it was over the course of just a few months that we got that working. And we have still have some edge case testing that we're going to go through. Uh, but it looks really, really solid. And our plan is to start actually upgrading, um, clients in the field starting in September. We also had a big hearts and minds challenge. Um, I had an entire uh, firmware team that is has a tremendous amount of domain knowledge and long legacy experience with the company. And I knew that if we just flipped over here and we abandoned those folks, that we were doing everybody a disservice. And I think we did a really good job of building on some of that initial excitement. Uh, to the point where um, I think we have the vast majority of folks have kind of self-selected that they want to go down the nerves path. And that's a pretty interesting change and a dramatic change. So how did we build this nerves team? Um, we, we started relatively, um, this wasn't that long ago. Um, back at, at Elixir slash nerves comp, we started putting out feelers and asking a lot of hard questions about what, what will we, what do we think we would run into? What's going to go on here? Um, we talked about possibly partnering with a couple of consultancies. Um, but I knew that if we wanted to go all in on this and make this happen, that I wanted to have this in house and I wanted to have people that were committed to this entire process and, I think we made the right choice in kind of holding out for some some really some solid senior talent on that front. So ultimately hired three nurse engineers, um, but we have also invested very, very heavily in educating, pairing with, and upskilling a lot of our existing C++ engineers to try to get them on the platform as well. Now, this has not been without its challenges. Um, we have a big deadline coming up in, on June 1st for the initial release of this entire platform, the whole new backend server with the new firmware. And we were trying to also upskill a team during that time. So you can imagine how much um, a, ba a balancing act that can be of having your experienced engineers just pushing forward and making things work versus balancing um, bootstrapping up the rest of your team. And I think we've threaded the needle on that um, I got to give you know huge shout outs to the, the folks that have been doing that. It is it has been an amazing job to balance that uh, that act. But we are in a place where we're only a little over a month away from our release, and everything is signaling green for for actually being able to do this. And this means that we've got a team of about six nerves engineers and one that floats back and forth. Um, that's a kind of a small team for what we're trying to accomplish and the speed at which we're trying to accomplish it. But I think it's probably okay in the long run once we get over this initial hump of a lot of work and the migration and the upgrade and all the other things that are going on. Time will tell on that front, but that's kind of how we've settled in right now. All right, so if you're, if you're trying to make this decision, what do you think, what do you, think you might be able to get out of this? Um, for me, I'm starting to see some really interesting speed in our dev cycles. Um, you know, it didn't even really occur to me initially that we were going to be able to actually run the firmware images on a, a, on a computer instead of the actual piece of hardware. But what's been really cool about that is we're now starting to provide that, that feature and functionality so that our server-side teams and our QA teams can have actual firmware images running and testing against where before we were investing a lot of time in uh, hardware simulators so that we could do similar things. But you know what the problem with that is, the, the simulator isn't exactly like the real device and it's, it's very expensive to keep them in sync over time. 
And so our ability to actually use the firmware image as a testing bed um, and not have to have it tied to a physical piece of deploy hardware is amazing. Um, again, this firmware update, we talked about this. Um, I think, you know, there was a little bit of consternation, at least in my head, when I saw the Nerves Hub thing kind of go away as a public service. Um, but that hasn't been an issue for us. You know, we, we pulled the code down. We're self-hosting uh, a version of this on AWS. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to contribute back and keep that alive because it is part of our infrastructure and we care deeply about having that, uh, that be a part of our, of our system. Uh, so we are using that. Um, we talked a little bit about the flexing of dev resources. I, I don't think there's really much more to say on that front, um, but I firmly believe that if you do have the luxury of going in on Elixir on the server side, whatever is backing up your IoT devices, that there is some cross-pollination that you can get there. And honestly, I think we're, we're eliminating an entire category of defects that I had been pounding my head against with the old firmware images just very low level chip timing things and whatnot that was just really, really hard to figure out and test against and ensure that it operated underneath all the various climactic conditions and, and vagarities of different uh, clients that we had. Um, so that's been, that's been nice to see. And time will tell if we've truly eliminated that category of defects, uh, but I'm cautiously optimistic. So, that's kind of what I wanted to share um, today. Uh, I think we've been in this about a half an hour and love to hear questions you guys have that I may be able to address. Thank you, Mike, for that really great talk. Um, I'm curious because you mentioned the memory management um, and on embedded devices, that can be a, a security concern like memory corruption problems. Um, so my question is, what security concerns have you seen during this project either on the device side or on more of the server side? Yeah, um, so from a security perspective, I think we're actually kind of making an interesting move forward. And part of this is hardware related, maybe part of it's firmware related, um, but our old uh, hardware devices were actually pass password authenticated back to the server. Um, and so we're moving back more to a, uh, a public private key type of strategy. And we're actually uh, implementing hardware that can generate that key uh, in a secure enclave so that we don't have to worry about key management uh, during manufacturing and things like that. So I think in some ways we've closed several security holes on that front. Um, I don't know that, that is, that's not necessarily specific to NERVs. Uh, I think that's just a better decision that we're making on how to, uh, how to move forward there. Um, I think your question was a little bit lower level. Is is that, am I? I mean, that's, that's really interesting. I, I like the key management stuff is a huge problem. Um, so it's like good to know about that. Yeah. And I think any, if you can, you know, from my perspective, you know, we, we're actually bringing a lot of our manufacturing on shore now. And so we have a little bit more uh, latitude to handle those keys in different ways. I was always a little bit paranoid about that when you're talking about manufacturing in China. Um, but even when you've got a local CM, um, I really don't want um, I really don't want them responsible for that. And I and I would love and I would prefer to be able to drop ship directly from the CM to our installers and not have to bring them into our own warehouse to do a finishing process. And so we're trying to eliminate those steps as well. And I think being able to generate that key securely on the device is going to pay for its that that in no time. Nice. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yep. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Fire away. But first of all, you know, just congratulations on making two big, making and getting them through the, the Elixir in 2016 or whatever, and now Nerves. Uh, so way to go, you know, don't let that go to your head, I guess, having, having made those mistakes myself. Uh, but uh, I think this is really interesting, you know, a lot of what I hear is, is folks from Elixir coming to Nerves or firmware development. And I really appreciate hearing the story of existing deployments and how that works. And I think, you know, a blog post about getting Nerves on that is, is would be super interesting, but 
Um, would also love to hear either if you could speak to it or just like the other perspective of these either C or Java folks going from that world to the Elixir and, and Nerves world. You kind of touched on it, but. Yeah, I mean, what what has their, their experience been in kind of going that direction? Um, you know, something we take for granted of just running running the code locally or on a dev environment. You say like the the investment of the hardware simulation, you know, I, I kind of have a concept of that, but it's it's still to me pretty novel. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how to best characterize that. Um, honestly, what has been most interesting, like a lot of our existing firmware engineers are out in Roanoke, Virginia. And so when I go out to that office, uh, most of our group is is not is completely remote, but we still have some legacy folks that are around offices. So when I go out there, um, you know, I just notice a very distinct difference in the tone and attitude because I feel like they've, they've kind of had a little bit of a blanket lifted up in terms of what's possible or how fast you can move through a problem set. Um, because I think they were mired down in a lot of very, very nuanced, low level things every single day. And we all have to dive into that every once in a while to keep things operational. But most of what we're trying to do as a business is deliver domain-based functionality. Like how do we cycle these thermostat or these HVAC compressors in a more efficient way? How do we change the lighting schedule to, to work underneath these other patterns? How do we grab some demand response revenue for our clients? Like those are the things that we care about. And I think the time spent on those types of things has gone from like 20% to maybe like 60%. Um, Cause you're just not bit twiddling as much in my mind. It's a pretty big win. Uh, any thoughts on like test coverage? Uh before versus after? Uh, well, this is maybe being a little bit too transparent. Uh, I can see Alex smirking behind the scenes <laughs> there. Um, dramatic. Uh, you know, the, the culture of at least the, the firmware engineers that I've worked with in the past that are coming from the lower level tool sets, there's no concept of unit testing and things like that. There's there's DBT type of testing and whatnot once you get, you know, things further down the path. But this was a very, very new concept for these engineers. Like how, like we can do test-driven development on firmware um, or maybe even some of the folks were like, what's test-driven development? Uh, and, you know, we're not, we're definitely not religious about doing test driven development, but it is something that a lot of people like and certain features and being able to work through things like that and, and build up some confidence of a, of a local test suite that you understand and you own was a new concept for this team. Just a thought uh, on Phoenix channels versus something more traditional like MQTT or what was the decision based on? Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, I'm a very, very big believer in what Live View um, gives web development uh, from a UI perspective. Uh, I've I've seen that um, that framework mature over the last several years, and the most recent releases allowing you to componentize things a lot better. Just make that whole experience of building web UIs really straightforward and quite pleasant. And if we already had that in place, and we were going all in for the web side of things. And there's a there's a library that enables that for our iOS interface. Then it really the question was well why can't we just use that same thing for our hardware interaction? Because uh, there's nothing wrong with something like MQTT. It's you know super ubiquitous and has a lot of advantages. But for me, it was trying to simplify the interface path to all of our external devices, whether they be browsers, iOS devices, or physical hardware. They all use the same technology. And we got presence for you know basically free, um, which is super important for us to understand connectivity and online status of the of different assets, um, and being able to do like real time fallbacks between our hardline connection and cellular connections and things like that. Like all that stuff was just nearly free, um, building on top of Phoenix channels. So that was pretty much the motivation. It wasn't the only way we could do that. But I was trying to keep everything simple and unified. And if we already had to do it in one tech, why not try to do it in another part of our tech stack? 
Yeah, great presentation. And I was curious about what the most difficult part of running um, Nerve Sub was. Uh, well, I actually don't know if I could have a great answer to that. Um, I think, you know, we were lucky in that sense that I've got a uh, an IT group that is really, really talented at doing um at doing AWS deploys and creating the right security perimeters and, and dealing with that whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. That is a, a huge boon. Like they have, they've done some really, really good work and they took on the challenge of spinning up the, the nerves hub implementation. And, you know, I think just taking all the things that they learned about deploying applications to that architecture, understanding and having our, security concerns well documented and just transposing those over to you know what we were trying to do on nerve sub it made it relatively straightforward i actually i think i mean we're not totally done with it when we're still going to be doing tweaks and, and improvements but i think from cradle to grave of idea to, to actually getting it running was just a hand, couple of weeks nice that's pretty good yeah yeah, you'd have to talk to my IT guys. They would probably go on and on and on about all of the gory details that uh, that are there. But uh, they made everybody else feel a little bit more confident because of the speed at which it, they got it uh, spun up. How did you manage uh, growing the team so fast and switching over to a new stack? That seems like a lot, but you managed to do it pretty quickly. Yeah, well, as far as the speed goes, um, I... I've always had a mixed history with recruiters and I got very, very lucky that I partnered with a, a recruiter that I honestly didn't know coming in. It was a person that had been working with our company before. He, that This recruiter was a little disillusioned with Gridpoint um, because in our old technology stack and whatnot, it was really hard to recruit. Like people weren't like selling the proposition of what we were doing. And it was, it was, you know, it was, it was frustrating, I think, to try to hire for us. And I kind of, and I changed the message there and I really got this guy excited about what we were trying to do. And I educated the recruiter about like, this is what's going on in, in the Elixir world and why I think some engineers would really care about being here. And he got pretty excited about it. And it took me a few months, maybe, I don't know, it took me four or five weeks to get him really up to speed on what was going on. But that was a huge boon um, because we started bringing in direct folks and we continued to have a few direct folks trickle in. But I, honestly, the, the, amount of, the amount of people that we had to kick out of the process that were coming in cold outside of a recruiter was just a huge waste of our time. You know, we're not a big company. You know, we, we grew from about 100 folks to about 200 folks last year. And a lot of that was in engineering. Um, and so, you know, we don't have a lot of bandwidth to really, you know, spend the amount of time that you have to, to interview hundreds and hundreds of candidates. So working with those recruiters, even though they, they charge an arm and a leg has some tremendous value. You know, we were getting to the point after we had really worked back and forth and given a lot of direct and critical feedback to our recruiters. We were getting to the point where we were getting a hit ratio of probably about 20% of the people that came in the door, we would extend an offer to, which I think is really high when you're being particular about things. And then we got, I, I, I mentioned it before, but it's, bare, it, it, it's worth repeating. We got about three quarters of the way through the hiring process and I shut the entire pipeline down. And I said, we will not accept another candidate that does not come from some diverse diversity channel. Um, so we had some a lot of cultural um, momentum within Gridpoint. There's a lot of people that were very, very vocal about needs, wants, and desires down that front. I'm like, okay, let's see if we can do this. And honestly, even with that constraint, we continue to hire at the same pace. And we don't have, you know, we're probably only about a, about a 40% diversity rate right now, but that's pretty good in this type of technology stack. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty proud of that number. Uh, so I think that was a big deal. And we we spent most of our team lead time for almost two months. Three months was almost 100% interviewing and building that team. 
And, you know, I was heavily involved in that. I always did the final interviews. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that we probably interviewed 400 people to build that 30 person team over the course of those, those two quarters. So I guess you have the 30 people, how do you actually say go and they all build something useful? So we have a uh, a pretty strong and significant product team, um, and we've aligned our product owners uh, to our engineering teams. Each, uh, one engineering team has a product owner. They have a specific subset of the platform that they're responsible for. They have an embedded QA engineer inside of that team, and that's vertically aligned all the way through, and they're responsible for delivering those subsets and features. Now we have a little bit of a cross-cutting concern with the nerves side of things, um, but we experimented with having the nerves engineers embedded within those individual teams, and we honestly backed off of that. And because we felt like the mentorship and leadership around a unified firmware vision and education strategy was more important than being vertically aligned there, and so that nerves team is supporting um, four uh, engineering teams. Can you describe uh, a bit about the hardware underneath uh, on the gateway? What kind of hardware are you using? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll talk about that, and and Alex can obviously ju obviously jump in and give more context there if I'm uh, if I'm saying something dumb. Um, but you know, the, without going into like the the processor details and whatnot, oh, I think he's going to grab the hardware and show it to you. Uh, the the technologies that are on one is that I was very um animate about moving towards a som based ar architecture where we didn't have a bunch uh as many pieces and parts so we could buy a more unified board to start with and so that that system on module is kind of the core and the brains of things we have a um a cellular modem uh that is our backup uh backhaul uh, where if our client's network goes down or their security model changes, that we can instantly flip back over to cellular and keep the keep our connectivity up. We have three different wireless technologies for local area connection. We've got Wi-Fi, we've got Bluetooth, and we've got LoRa. Um, and you know those are kind of the the primary you know major components on the board. And if we want to go into more depth, then I'm going to punt that one. Yeah, I can uh, I can add a little bit to that too. So, uh, like Mike mentioned, we're we're based off of microchip. Um, the cool thing is this uh, microchip development kit um, has a nerve system for it. So we've also been kind of bringing that up to speed uh, as well. Uh, we've got two devices. I think Mike has kind of blended them together a little bit, but we have a controller that we've migrated in the field that's primarily wired. We have another one in development that's primarily wireless. So we've got a bunch of different technologies coming together for there. Uh, the actual processor off of that um, uh, from microchip is on the, I'll show it off in a second, that's on the wired version. The new product is using the entire module, so we can just buy the module that comes with the Wi-Fi radio, the processor, the RAM. Like it's it's basically got everything you need out of the box, except any of the other peripherals you want to add onto the system. Just all of that module, so we can slap that on our own PCB and ship that. So this is basically the development kit to get started with it, and then you uh, you engineer that into your own product. Uh, this is the development, I'm holding the development kit box, but basically this is the, uh, the controller that we have installed that's in sites. Um, so this is that, that wired controller with my debug cable coming out of the side. Um, and so this is running that, that, uh, microchip processor. This is what we just ported over to nerves and, uh, yeah, that's what the hardware looks like. I think you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that having engineers do the GUI was one of the problems. I don't think you addressed that. Were you doing GUIs on the nerve devices? Oh, yeah, that was actually a little bit of snark about um, not having uh, interaction designers be responsible for the interface itself and letting an engineer try to lay out things. Um, it's an ongoing like joke and sore spot of mine that uh, 
please, please, please invest in really good interaction designers. They are not graphic artists. They really understand different things. Um, it, you will absolutely pay for their talent 10 times over. But yeah, we're not actually putting an interface on the next generation of the controller. Uh, you saw the one that he that uh, Alex showed you that actually does have a uh, have an interface to it. Um, our next generation with all the wireless tech, we're taking the screen off of that and um, making it exclusively interfaced through either the back end system, or that's also why we have the Bluetooth radio in there for our installers to do local area debugging and configuration if we have a connectivity problem uh, at that time. So we're using the iPhone screen as our screen for the new ones. Makes sense. Earlier you mentioned that I think it was 20 and 60% um, comparing kind of like low level work to like business value. So it seems like there's this incredible benefit for companies to, you know, adopt NERVs. Um, how do you think that could happen? Like you're a CTO at a company, like how do you even learn about NERVs and Elixir? Um, because it seems, you know, this group has some interest in, in more adoption of NERVs. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think I'm a firm believer that it, you shouldn't be a CTO if you're not out there, you know, trying to understand what's going on in the technology world. And I don't, I don't fully appreciate and comprehend all of the details that a lot of my engineering team can can pontificate about. But I think developing an intuition about how things are moving and how and changing in the technology world is the only reason you should be sitting in that seat. And so if you've got a, a, you know, a CTO that is not doing that, maybe there's another problem there. Um, but okay, we've got that reality. If you need to help educate you know, somebody, I, I think that it, it really does come down to um, changing the conversation from what's cool about the technology to how do you tie that to the things that they're gonna need to stand in front of a board of directors and ask for money or uh, defend a a timeline that is you know maybe going to have some initial setbacks because that's the reality of of changing something is that you're you're expecting that this slowdown that you're paying for right now to have some benefit in the in the long run and you know anything that we can do to help arm people that have a foot in both trenches between business and technology to make a more and more intelligent argument that way, I think is super important. Um, Cause honestly, I had to do a little bit of that kind of by the seat of my pants when I was presenting this to initially to our executive team and then to our board of directors. Um, and it's nothing about the tech, the actual detailed technology. It's all about how you tie that to productivity, stability, um, things like that. And, and like I said, that was where I had a little bit of ace in the hole because we had some challenges. Like we had some stability challenges. We had some connectivity challenges. We had firmware update challenges. I bet though that most people experience that to some degree. So how do you double down and explain what NERVS deals with in those pieces? Because uh, when I first started hearing talks, you know, years ago about NERVS and that was the, the things that I initially latched onto was the firmware update cycle, you know, things like that, because that's where it's just petrifying to have a large number of hardware devices out there and to push that button to do a firmware update and wondering if you're going to brick something and it's going to cost you two, three, four million dollars to go and unwind that. Like that is, that's huge. And anything you can do to, to help talk to that story right there is going to be, in my mind, the thing that's going to flip more and more people over. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it seems like the work you know that you've done is a really good, not only a technical case study, but the business case study as well. I hope so. I really mm -hmm. hope we can get back a little bit because I, I believe full wholeheartedly in this. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, I want to see more and more people adopt it and Whatever I can do to help you, yeah, please uh, ask. I will. I will be there. Just out of curiosity, you mentioned demand response. Uh, probably some forecasting. Are you using any ML on the edge? <laughs> uh, not on the edge. We're actually pulling back a lot of our compute 
back to the server that had initially been implemented on the controller itself. And we still have some, we still have intelligence. We, um, but I think the best way to think about it in our use case is that we've made our business model up today at, as a behind the meter solution. And what I mean by that, for those of you that are not in the electricity lingo, is how do we optimize an individual building behind that one meter? If you're just optimizing that building, you can put a lot of computed intelligence on that energy controller, and there's a lot of advantages to doing that. But we're moving into a world where we're not just optimizing that building, we're optimizing also a distributed virtual power plant of thousands of buildings and monetizing those as grid level assets. And when you, uh, and when you have to solve the problems like that, you can't have all of the decisions being made on the edge. Most of those decisions need to be made back on the server side. And then the controller itself takes guidance or demands from the server and handles a lot of the nuance of how to figure out what to do within that local area network. Given that uh, the, the, on your team, there's so many developers who are new to the technology and you have these tight deadlines, have there, any been, have there been any special considerations to deal with um, mitigating tech debt and that sort of thing? Um, yeah, so... Um, I am a violent believer in scope management. And I've told the team time and time again that here's like, we're not moving the date, we're not moving the quality, but I will push all kinds of scope around every single day. And we started doing aggressive scope management months ago. Because uh, I believe firmly that every single requirement that gets written has at least 20% fluff in it. And if we can continuously find those, then we can we stand a much, much better chance of hitting our deadlines. And I think we built a culture around that. And honestly, I and I hope that my developers would speak up, but I, I'll, I'll go out on a limb here and say that I think part of the reason why we've got such a group of people that are so dedicated to, to hitting this date and getting things out the door is because they understand that I've got their back and I'm like, I'm willing to, to go in there with a red pen and say, no, we're delaying that piece. We can get away with not doing this. And when you constantly hear that week in and week out, where somebody in leadership is saying, no, it's okay. We're not going to go and work 60 hour weeks to get this done. We're going to change the scope. You have a different mentality and a different buy-in from the group at that point. It's true. Ah, yes. Yes. Have a, one of my developers on. Awesome. Hey, Bonnie, how are you doing? No, it. I, I agree with um, everything that Mike said so far. It really, you know, Gridpoint is the most collaborative place, um, and we have very, very high quality standards. I, I love it here. Uh, I'll say I, I work for Gridpoint, too. Um, you know, just the whole... <laughs> The, just having a whole new group of people come in and work on this new greenfield thing and you know uh just even if we're even if you're not doing hands-on nerves but you know just doing an i just working on an iot project and you know uh <clears throat> and doing some good in the world with you know energy reduction uh that's uh that that i think keeps us uh Keeps morale up. I'm curious about the your approach to scope reduction, and if you have any resources you could point to, because I'm I'm curious to learn more about that sort of idea uh, or approach. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure, like point to a resource, but I, I think it's just a fundamental like day in and day out process um, where you have to ask the hard questions about what is really needed in in this given requirement. Because let's face it, you know, most people in technology or in product or things like that, like there's this like intrinsic drive to like do more, more, more. But but when you step back and you look at how software is actually used, so many features are not used or not used heavily, mm -hmm. and they don't actually connect to your revenue stream. And that is the real the real key there. It's like at being belligerent about understanding, is this requirement going to move the revenue needle? 
And that isn't just, you know, are we going to sell more things? It's also, are we going to retain more customers? Are we going to get better word of mouth? There's a lot of things that go into that. But um, having that pragmatic discussion every single day is is really the the culture that I hope we're cultivating. And I got I got to put a lot of it on our that, our product team. Like I, I don't think that they were there maybe six months ago in doing that, um, but they've turned the corner dramatically in how uh, they've almost now picked up the banner and said, okay, yeah, um, how can we deliver less and still make our customers happy? I don't know if I answered your question, but that's probably as far as I can go on that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. Mike? Yeah, I, I appreciated the answer on scope. Uh, whether you call it refining or cutting, uh, very appreciated. Um, so you, you talked a bit about how you said yes to Elixir and yes to nerves. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the things you said no to, whether either other technology decisions or any any anything that comes to mind. Uh, the one that I think I've got several developers hating me for saying no on was Flutter. Um, I am a very, very bigoted person when it comes to these unified UI frameworks. I've seen them come and go too many times. Um, I'm a big believer in if you're going to build to a system, you use the native API. Um, I know I'm in the minority there. Um, but I, uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. So I said it's a pretty hard no on some of those unified visual or like, um, yeah, the GUI frameworks that, that claim to be able to go cross platform. Uh, that was a hard no. Um, we also, um, moved, uh, away from, a pretty heavy heavy dependency on microservices. Um, I wouldn't call us a monolith exactly, but we're probably closer to that side of things. Um, I believe that that debate has kind of turned into a little bit of a religious debate and you're trading one set of problems for another. I like the problems more that are a little bit more on the monolith side than the problems that you get on the microservices side. They both have their own issues, but I like the development problems as opposed to the deployment problems, which is where you get in microservices. Um, and that, that probably is speaking to my own personal bias and history where I've come from a development background. And so my head works better about how do you make the code work rather than how do you make the infrastructure work. Um, so I'm just more comfortable down that path probably. I had a question if if I'm next in line about the flow of thinking, Mike. And I, I think I agree with you. It's like, you know, the unified frameworks save you time but they don't give you very native results but what i really enjoyed seeing at elixirconf last year was you know the live view native release and it, it seems like that's coming along and you can sort of have your cake and eat it too what's your take on that from a cto perspective it's a really interesting question because i was in that same presentation and, and listened to that and I, and I talked with um i talked with some of the folks uh, outside of that and I think my biases still kind of hold on that, that it's like, um, it's gonna be a lot of work to continue over time to keep up with the Apple, the Android API integrations. And that's the part I worry most about. It's like, I think, I think it's really, really, really cool. But I wonder if a company of that size is gonna have the wherewithal to stick around and keep up to date with that for a decade. And that's why I, I would I would be personally hesitant to bet on that on that technology. Not because it isn't awesome and it would and it would be like super cool to be able to do it. And I and I fully appreciate the elegance of the technical solution. I worry about it from a business perspective. And I have the same concerns because it's sort of like at what point is it ready enough to convince clients to put it into their projects. And I, and I don't know, but it is know the certainly a risk measurement. And I, I think that the, I think it's a little bit of a boogeyman where people put out, oh, it's so expensive to develop for two or three different platforms. Really? Is it? Because I tell you what, I have one iOS developer that is keeping up 
with an entire elixir back end. And she is incredibly productive. Like we've gone from zero to almost a full-fledged installer application for managing this whole process in a matter of months. That's not a big investment. And it's all native Swift UI stuff. I think, you know, traditionally it's been a bigger investment. And so, you know, to manage risks, you need to have a bigger team than one because that's a key person risk. It is a key person risk. I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm definitely a little light there, but I just wanted to illustrate the fact that the technology stacks and like the way things are being developed now are different than it was five or 10 years ago. The velocity you can get out of a tiny, tiny team is astounding. Preaching to the converted there, mate. <laughs> awesome. So you have moved to Elixir, right? So in terms of memory performance compared to C++, did you guys evaluate it already? Are you talking about like on the hardware itself? Yes. Uh, the yes. Um, you know, we we didn't, that wasn't one of our primary design concerns. Um, and part of that was because, like I mentioned earlier, that we're pulling a lot of the hardcore processing and logic back to the server. So we're not doing like running, you know, evaluations of large neural networks or anything like that um, on there. And so I don't think that we're actually pushing the hardware very hard uh, with the types of, of challenges that we have. So it really just what didn't surface as one of our biggest concerns. Um, but that I think we're a little, maybe a little bit unique in that sense. Um, I think everybody, and the other thing we had going for us is that we understand pretty distinctly what we're trying to accomplish, the amount of traffic that we're trying to deal with, um, the response times that we have, and we could pick a, uh, a processor that had a reasonable amount of headroom. And honestly, unless somebody you know on, on my team wants to chime in and, and disagree, which uh, I don't think we've, I don't think we're even in a remotely uh, dangerous area of that performance envelope of what we've got. Hope I evaded your question effectively enough. If everyone's out of questions now, um, well, we can, uh, we can move on to other things. Uh, so thank you very much, Mike, for the presentation. This has been great. And uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for, for chiming in and asking questions and uh, participating there. Yeah, thanks everybody. And if you have any follow-ups, anything I can do for you guys, um, I, I really do want to be giving back to this community. It is, it is it's a major part of our architecture and uh, that's super important to me.